All right, we are live. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I was getting so involved in the music. It's for a purpose, right? We are here for a purpose. So I am Linda Moore Singleton. I am the administrator for the Office of Health and Human Services um, Drug and Alcohol Division. It is an honor, like a true honor to welcome everyone to the 2022 Black History Month celebration. Um, this year is really a great topic for our community, you know, health and wellness. I appreciate that. And I really like to thank the committee for putting this awesome, awesome, you know, event together for the month. So, you know, just so you understand, it doesn't end on February 28th, right? We have our assignments and our assignments is to educate, educate, educate. You all have been assigned. So we can't leave here saying that we don't understand what the next role and goal and responsibility of us to our community, right? So I just wanna say thank you, welcome, welcome. Everybody just sit back, relax and get ready to be informed, educated and spiritually renewed. So I would like to turn this over. We are now gonna hear the invocation from Dr. Reverend, from Reverend Dr. Lorraine Marshall Blake. And I am sorry I chopped your name up because I was trying to see if it was Marshall Blake or Blake Marshall. So you, you go right on ahead. Thank you. Okay, I'm a child of the King, so it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what way you put it, okay? Um, let us pray. In Psalm 118, it says that um, this is the day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And then Psalm 139 says, we are marvelously and wonderfully made. And when we were yet in our mother's womb, he knew all about us. So he knew all about the day and all of us that would be on this call today. And then in Psalm 131, it says, oh, how sweet it is when brethren come together in unity. So we've come together in unity and purpose, but let us pray. Dear Father God, we come right now, Lord, first to give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise that you are so worthy of. Lord, there's a song they said, I feel it in the atmosphere, the presence of the Lord is here. And Lord, the Lord's people have gathered this day, oh God, to offer our prayers, our praise, and our supplications. And Lord, this month, we celebrate Black History Month, and specifically today, Black Health and Wellness. And Lord, it's not just for today, but it's for 365 days of the year, oh God. So Lord, we come together to honor the culture of our brothers and sisters. Lord, we remember the legacy of all those who came before us. And Lord, we must remember to remember all those who have gone before us, all those who hug courage from despair so that we could sit right here today. So Lord, when, even when it gets tough, let us remember that you and you alone are the great I am and our source of strength and purpose for each new day. Lord, help us in everything that we do to honor you with our work. And we've got justice, we've got healing, we've got peace in this day. Help us as we labor for the end of hunger. Lord, let us make sure when they say, am I my brother or sister's keeper? Absolutely, oh God. So help us to look out for one another. And Lord, help us to value diversity beyond variety. Help us to value diversity with a vision for a progressive future that acknowledges our strength together. Lord, we are stronger together as well as the power, creativity, and ideas, oh God. So Lord, again, we just thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for all that are gathered. Lord, let this time not just be a moment, oh God, but let it be something that will go on uh, each and every day of this, not just of this month, but of this year. So Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to serve. We thank you for all that are gathered. And it's this we ask in your precious son's name, Jesus the Christ, let us all say, Amen. Let the church say amen. 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 Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Garfield Jackson, and I have the distinct honor to serve as your uh, program moderator today. Mm -hmm. But first, I want to thank uh, uh, Mary. I'm sorry. Uh, first, I want to thank. Uh, I'm sorry. I, my notes here. Yeah. I'll just look at name. I'm sorry, Linda Moore Singleton for uh, <laughs> that for, for that opening. I really, really, uh, it was really nice. And thank you for uh, saying the things that you said about our committee. Uh, we have worked hard and uh, 
it's all rewarding. And we're always thankful for uh, a word of prayer. And we thank Dr. Uh, Lorena for that wonderful, wonderful prayer. Uh, on behalf of our entire uh, Black History Month uh, committee, we thank you for being with us today and throughout our entire Black History Month weekly programs. I'd also like to take uh, a minute to send prayers and condolences mm -hmm. to the families and friends who have lost loved ones over this past year. Yeah. We have all been experiencing some trying times, physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. At this time, I, we will have Tim Odeas Pay uh, sing the Negro National Anthem, Amen. lift every voice and sing. Amen. <clears throat> Peace and blessings, everybody. It's an honor to be here. Good to have you. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmony yes. of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of a baby gun, let us march on to victory is one stony the road we tried bitter the chastening rod felt in the days when hope unborn had died yet with the steady Beat, have not our weary feet come to the place for which our Father sighed? We have come over a way that with tears has been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered out from the gloomy past till now we stand at last where the white gleam of our bright star is cast God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far on the way, thou who has by thy let us into the light. Keep us forever in the path. We pray. Let's start. 
feet stray from the places our god where we met thee bless our feet drunk with the wine of the world we forget thee shadowed beneath thy hand may we forever stand true to our god true to our native land thank you thank you mr timotheus pay thank you so very much you you certainly did our new national anthem uh, uh justice there thank you uh moving right along we will now have remarks by uh this barbara o'malley who was the deputy chief operating officer at Montgomery County. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, everyone. It is an honor and pleasure to be here with you today on the third session of our Black History Month celebration, and particularly here for the theme of mental and spiritual health. Both of these issues, mental and spiritual health, are so critical to each of us, yet for so long have had such a stigma attached to speaking about them. Even with their strong religious independence as a nation, people are uncomfortable speaking about their religious or spiritual beliefs publicly. I was struck that not very long ago, during one of our county racial equity learning community meetings, we had an icebreaker activity and many of us shared things about who we were and what was important to our identity. And a number of people talked about their spirituality and how it helped shape who they were and such a big part of their lives even today. Yet we do not talk or think enough about people and how they get their spiritual needs met when we design our programs, serve our clients, deal with one another, and think about our systems and services. And for the Black community, where church was one of the few institutions that could be relied upon to serve and protect them, and faith being such a critical part of the culture, it is even more important. And when we think of insurance and health insurance, we think about medical and dental and vision, but we need to openly talk about mental health coverage and the services and providers and preventative mental health care that's needed. One of the more positive things that have come from the pandemic is more openness around it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to share that you're not doing well, that you need to have some self-care. And while we need more resources to treat mental health issues, we need more work to support individuals and families before they become overwhelmed. And we know that stress and burdens are heavier for black families and people of color that just being black in America is a stress that can inflict trauma on individuals and generations that follow. I'm grateful for the work of our speakers here today, that what they do in this area to bring attention to the value of mental and spiritual health. And I look forward to hearing their thoughts on how we can work together to support one another. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. O'Malley, for those, uh, for those kind of remarks. Uh, moving right along, uh, over the last two Wednesdays, the Black History Month Committee has featured programs on the topics of holistic Black wellness and maternal child care. Our focus today will be on mental and spiritual health. All of these topics are all components under our National Black History Month theme, Black Health and Wellness. We have some excellent panelists here with us today. And I will have a pleasure to introduce them in a few minutes. But first, let's go over some uh, minor housekeeping uh, guidelines for our guests, as well as our panelists. Uh, housekeeping rules for our guests, we want to encourage you to put your questions, put your questions in the chat. I promise that we will get you your questions, uh, but don't uh, feel as though there's a question that uh, you want to ask and don't do it. So we, we, we want to encourage you to put those questions there. Uh, keep your phones and whatever device that you're on on mute. I thank you for that. Uh, housekeeping rules for our panelists. We, 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 uh, we have some for you guys as well. Uh, not that we need it, but you know, we just thought that we just put that in there. Uh, each panelist, uh, we would like to you know, have five minutes to answer the main question, the main question that we've given you. Uh, the two remaining panelists will have time 
five minutes collectively to comment on your question as well. So we want to get input from all three of you on, on all of the questions, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, but we want to stay within those time restrictions. Um, please keep your chat open so that uh, you can be notified when we get to the 30 second mark of that five minute period and uh, that, that are remaining on your responses. Then at the end, we will, we will have some wrap up uh, questions that we, that we feel are, are very important to the committee. Uh, and uh, then we will finally take the questions uh, from our guests that, that are in the chat today. Uh, as I introduce our distinguished panel today, please keep in mind that you can find their uh, complete bios on the Montgomery County website uh, backslash Black History Month. Uh, what, what I will give you is just a taste of, of, of the bios of uh, this distinguished panel with us today. Uh, the one thing that we have had over uh, the last two weeks is we have all we have had good panelists that we have that, that have really kept everyone engaged, and we're thankful that we're blessed uh, to to have three uh, more distinguished panelists today. Our first uh, our first panelist is Dr. Tony Warner McIntyre. Dr. Warner McIntyre is a clinical social worker and therapist. She is passionate about helping teens and adults who feel disconnected in their lives and relationships to feel more connected in those areas. She has worked in the field of social work for over a decade and has spent the time supporting and connecting with children, teens and adults in many different settings. Welcome Dr. Warner McIntyre and good afternoon to you. Could you please give us a brief response so everybody knows who you are? Hello everyone, thank you for having me. And I just have to say, I'm so honored, but also so pleased that we are having a conversation of spiritual and mental health together. How often do you get to have <laughs> that conversation, especially in mainstream, right? Like mainstream with the county. So. I'm honored to be a part of this. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you for being here. You've, uh, we've been in communication. You've been very excited about being here. That's for sure. Uh, our next panelist is uh, Marcus Allen. He is the first black chief executive officer of Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Independence, and has served in that position since 2013. In that role, he has been able to enact a vision of youth mentoring programs designed to help positively transform the lives of children facing adversity in greater Philadelphia and Southern New Jersey through seven counties. Welcome Marcus Allen to the program today and uh, good afternoon. And can you give us some opening remarks? Yes, I can brother Garfield. It is uh, <laughs> awesome to be in front of all of you today. As Garfield said, I'm Marcus Allen, CEO of Big Brothers and Big Sisters Independence. I am looking forward to today's conversation. Anytime I get a chance to sit on a panel with my mom, Dr. Lorena Marshall Blake, uh, it is always, always a pleasure. So I'm happy to be here, my friend. We're really, we're really glad to have you. And you know, since I'm sitting on this side of the screen, you know, so I'm kind of in charge today. Okay, so just so you know, Marcus Allen is my CEO at the Big Brothers and Big Sisters Independence. Thanks a lot for being here. And uh, our final panelist for today is Reverend Dr. Lamina Marshall Blake. She is president of the Independence Blue Cross Foundation and also the vice president of community affairs at Independence Blue Cross. She is the former president of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, Omega Omega chapter in Philadelphia. She is also an associate minister at the Vine Memorial Baptist Church in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Welcome Reverend Dr. Marshall Blake. Thank right. you so much for that beautiful invocation and good afternoon to you as well. Could we have some opening remarks? Certainly, thank you, Brother Garfield. It's so wonderful to be with you today. Um, I'm just excited when we have the opportunity to talk not only about 
the, our physical health, but talk about our mental and spiritual and how they all are intertwined. So I just stand on tiptoe expectation and anticipation of where this conversation will go today. So again, I thank you for the opportunity to participate and look forward uh, to uh, a robust conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lorena. Uh, the, yeah. you know, once again, we want to give uh, a shout out to the uh, entire uh, Black History Month event committee. Uh, we have uh, worked diligently. I, I think every year we start a little bit earlier and earlier. I think we started in, was it June, Laura, or was it uh, July? I, I'm not sure. But we started early, but we put together, I think, a, a, a great program over the entire month. And we and the topic is so needed, and we, we, we just have a lot of excitement around uh, the entire uh, Black History Month. So our first question goes to, uh, since you have it up here, Dr. Tony, and, and so I don't mess up anybody else's name here, uh, I'm going to just call you Dr. Tony. Uh, and your question is, what are uh, major barriers for African Americans in getting adequate mental health care? Thank you, Garfield. And I appreciate that question. I reflected on, on what I wanted to share here because there's a time and a place to discuss statistics. They help kind of paint a broader picture, a broader understanding. But I would like to take the time to really connect with you all emotionally because isn't that the bridge between spiritual and mental health anyway? Our emotions, right? Like how we feel. That's what we're here to talk about. And so I'm gonna share a bit of my story and connect that to this question here that you've asked me that I think is really important. So I was born of a white woman and a black man, both pastors. So I was born as a multiracial daughter of pastors who also divorced one another. And we had to navigate what that looked like. And so the way I was raised was that there wasn't really a place for emotion unless it was anger. There wasn't really a place for emotion. And what I had to figure out was how to deal with that. And so to me, it became, I needed to be the strong one. And I see this so often, especially in minority women. I see this so often, I have to be the strong one, which means, which translates to my emotions don't matter. I have to keep them guarded, hidden, or pushed down. And I need to do whatever I can to take care of everyone else. And ultimately, when you live a life that way, it leads to burnout. So by the time I was in elementary school, I had already put myself on multiple diets because I wanted, I wanted to fit in. And I didn't feel like I did. By the time I was in middle school, I was already cutting myself up and I was binging and purging and I was really good at hiding it. Gifted student, you would have never known. But I didn't, I still, I didn't feel like I fit in. And so my black counterparts, they would say, well, you think you're too good to be black because of the way that you speak, because of the grades that you have. And so I actually remember a time in seventh grade, I think it was seventh grade, when I tried to act unintelligent, basically, because I just wanted them to be like, I just wanted to be liked. I wanted them to see, I don't think I'm better than you at all. And of course that just made me feel worse because then my grades went down and that didn't feel good either. I couldn't win. And then to my white friends, I was the token black girl. So as I started dating, oh, Tony can come, but not her black boyfriend. Oh, Tony can come over. Oh, but, but, but not her black so-and-so. And so there wasn't a place for me, not even in the church where my parents were pastors because people hated us before they met us because this was a female pastor with someone who is divorced, right? So she's divorced her partner and she's got these kids that like, I don't know, are they good or are they not? When you're a pastor's kid, I, I think Marcus, you, you mentioned the mother, right? When you're a pastor's kid, it's like, there's a sense of you're either the devil or the angel. And there's no in between, but you know what? I couldn't, I, I couldn't find my place regardless. So then by the time I was in high school, the binging and purging continued, the strong one mentality continued my shame around how I was feeling, but couldn't tell anyone continued. And so my anxiety and depression grew in secret that led to college where I got really, really good at overachieving involved in all the extracurriculars, one of the head RAs up for a bunch of awards, bam. 
landed in the hospital, mandatory stay, because I took a bunch of pills, cut myself up. And my question wasn't, it wasn't, I don't want to live. My question was, God, I know I was born with a purpose. Can you please tell me if I'm done? Like, did I just fulfill it? Because I've already done everything I can think to do. And I still don't feel fulfilled. I still don't feel fulfilled. My question was answered because I lived. And then the next year, I actually got pregnant with my daughter and became a single mom, even though I continued on to complete two master's degrees and my doctorate. But even after doing that, I still didn't feel good enough. Still didn't feel good enough. And that is what changed my life when I realized I'd completed all my lofty goals and I still didn't feel good enough. What does that have to do with barriers to mental health in the Black community? Well, although my experience is mine, and yours is yours, and each of us have our own experiences, there are still some common core experiences that so many that I work with speak to support experience. That's shame. Shame for feeling the way that I feel, thinking no one else could possibly understand. And there's a certain way to be Black. And so if I feel this way, and it doesn't fit in with the expectation of this Black culture and, and community that I love and adore, then something's not right. Is there something wrong with me? And then it doesn't feel safe to go outside of that community or culture to share the emotions that are coming up. So first I have to admit that I'm feeling this way. And then I have to go outside of my culture. I have 30 seconds left, so I'm gonna wrap this up. Then I have to go outside of my culture to ask for help, to ask for help, right? That doesn't feel strong. Emotions are vulnerable, emotions are weak and that doesn't feel safe. And so some of the pieces that are really important here is I just wanna end with Martin Luther King's words that I think are really powerful. He talks about how, you know, government can impact what is socially acceptable behaviorally, but it is our attitudes, us as individuals, that when we can shift that, we can be the power that changes the systems. And so in order to do that, we need to be able to feel our feelings and know that you're not betraying your culture. You're not betraying yourself. There is not something wrong with you. And so I'm going to close that there because I know that I'm limited on time, but Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Tony. Thank you. Wonderful. Very, very, uh, very, very profound uh, statements there. Uh, we're going to open the floor to our, our other other panelists for the same question, and we'll start start with Dr. Uh, Arena. Uh, okay. What what are the major barriers for African Americans in getting adequate mental health? I think Dr. Tony hit on many of them. Okay. And that it's and I heard the uh, Miss O'Malley say it's okay not to be okay. Be okay, right? And we have to be able to receive that. Okay. Um, again, when you look at the barriers, whether it's economic, whether she talked about being a PK kid, where there's this expectation that you got to be all that, a bag of chips and snaps. Okay. Um, I can totally relate to to being in um a situation where when I wanted to do the right thing, I was acting white as opposed to just excelling and doing well. I think we have to learn how to change the narrative on what is, what, how do we define success? Um, I think, again, we have to learn how to embrace one another where we're at in an effort to get folks to where we want them to be. Um, and again, um, if you see one person, you see one person. And when she talked about what is her purpose, every one of us has purpose. And on my wrist is, I wear it every day, that Jeremiah 29, 11, it yeah. says, the Lord I declares, I have a purpose well, for your life, not to harm you, but to prosper, to give you hope. And see, that's the other thing that our children have to know that they have, that they are not hopeless that they can be hopeful, that they have hope and doggone it, they have a future. And I'm gonna pass that over to Marcus because Marcus deals with our young people on a day to day with his bigs. So, you know, again, we've got to embrace them. And guess what? They're not gonna, kids come messy. And half the time we've messed them up before they've gotten there. Yeah. So we've got to help straighten out the mess and embrace them and tell them, yes, you can not no, you can't. So Marcus, I'm gonna pass Very it over. Well. Okay. Marcus. Deal with the babies, okay? <laughs> Marcus is yours. Me, thanks for letting me deal with the baby, Mama. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, this is this is such a deep, deep question, yeah. I feel, and yeah. I appreciate you asking it. 
And of course, there's not enough time on this call today to really delve into this. Um, but some of the barriers that I've seen, like the, the challenges, and, and first, Dr. Tony, thank you for sharing your story and being just yeah. vulnerable and authentic in, in your story. Um, you know, I, I've been working with kids in Philadelphia now um, since 2000, so 22 years. Wow, I'm dating myself. I turned 50 on Friday, ma. Oh, God, I can't stand it. You're my baby, along with Ken Lawrence. The I know. My yes. brother's on the call. My brother's on the call. Yes. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, I, when, when I first started out in doing this work, I saw how we treated particularly Black kids when it comes to challenges, and we call them disorders. And we are yes. so quick to put labels on our kids. And, and oftentimes, and, and I know I got some, some county folks on this call and some other folks, but I'm gonna tell the truth today. Oftentimes we put these labels on these kids for money, right? We have these kids that we know that we can get paid in certain systems if kids have certain diagnosis and now we can marginalize those kids and put them away in the corner and not have to deal with them. And so, my, my challenge to us is, yes, uh, we all need therapy. Yes, there are, there are people and young people who do have certain challenges that are scientific, that is empirical evidence that and they have chemical imbalances that are causing them certain cha challenges and they need services, yeah. they need support. My biggest concern though is let's not create barriers or bigger barriers than already exists for our kids. And we have to listen to them. And, 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 and Dr. Lorena Marshall Blake, Ma, I need you, because you are a leader in the field, in the insurance field, like to the point that was made earlier, we need more dollars and support for people who are dealing with mental health challenges. Exactly, exactly. Well, let me jump in, and may I jump in again, Garfield? Yep. Do I have permission? Yes, go ahead. Okay, um, there, and to tie in again with uh, what, uh, Marcus was talking about uh, the Independence Blue Cross Foundation, the foundation hat that I wear. We're doing a, a pilot with Gerard College right now that's dealing with mental health. And we're working with Children's Hospital and again, working on their academics, but 80% of that population, and it's about 400 students, either has experienced trauma or been in trauma. Wow. So we're working with them and, the, and not just them, but their families, because again, you know, Gerard College is a residential setting. So when they leave, they go home. So we've got to deal with the trauma in the family too. And I saw a question in the uh, chat that asked who's responsible with regard to the, who changes the narrative. Is it government? Um, is it business? Is it media? But again, I, a lot of it, 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 it it begins at home and how do we affect that, you know, those things that are happening right there in the home? Because if I'm hungry, guess what? I don't want to come to school. I'm not going to function. Okay. So again, when it comes <coughs> to, so food insecurity, again, is a big one that's out there right now with regard to mental health. Because if you're hungry, you're, nothing's working. Okay. Uh, it, you are dysfunctional. But I think I go back to what um, Marcus said. We have to stop labeling Oh, she's just bad. Well, if she or he's just bad. And if they are, there's a reason why. They didn't come here that way. All right. So, okay. so again, I, I think we, we have to, to stop saying, being so quick to put a title on it and to put a name on it. And the other thing, when I look at Dr. Tony, thank you. And I've got your information, Dr. Tony. There aren't enough therapists out there that look like me. <laughs> And, and again, it's not that I cannot relate to someone that is a Caucasian, but when I can see someone that looks like me, when I hear her experience, I've had that experience in a different way, but she gets it. And that makes a difference when it's somebody that looks exactly like you. So again, the foundation has a program with the Black Brain Campaign, where we're helping to license therapists that look like me. So I'm, okay. I'm not just talking about it. I'm putting my money where it belongs in an effort to make a difference. But Marcus, yeah, you're right. There needs you, to be you, more, you, more all, you always do. You, you always do, Dr. Lorena. So okay. uh, certainly, and I, I just want to say that we, you know, we we are getting some questions in the chat. Yeah. And and you know, we want to get to our uh, questions that okay. we have assigned so far. So we uh, and but we'll we will circle back to them. Okay. Uh, cool. So, all right. I uh, didn't want to. But thank you for 
thank all of you for, uh, for your response to that question. Uh, the next question is for Marcus Allen. And I know that you could take a long time on this next question, Marcus, but you, you, you still have the same <laughs> amount of time. Okay. <laughs> so, so how does racism, poverty, incarceration, trauma, et cetera, affect mental health? Yeah, um, well, let me first start. Someone mentioned Martin Luther King, and as you can see, I, I have Martin Luther King's uh, uh, picture behind me. And, and on that picture, it says everybody can be great because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace and it's soul generated by love. And so uh, I, I start off with that because I, I, I want to make sure that we stay optimistic and positive, even though we're talking about some really deep stuff, right? I never want, we never want to leave our audience with, oh my God, things are just so bad. And so we're, 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 we, we tend to, in these panel discussions, talk about the challenges and really not talk about, there's some really great work that's happening. And I don't know if we're going to have time to go into that today, Garfield. But um, I will say that when I saw the question, I thought like it, 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 it it's, um, it got different levels of things wrapped into that question because yeah. racism to me permeates all of it, right? And so racism needs to be taken out and, and, and kind of be like the foundation. And then you have poverty, incarceration, trauma, and how they affect mental health. And so I'll deal with racism first because that's the one that I believe causes the greatest degree of pain in all three of those others, poverty, incarceration, and trauma. Um, and, and oftentimes people don't want to, they don't want to see racism because um, it's, it's such an ugly thing to think that, you know, we are all affected by it, whether we are victims or perpetrators. Um, and I, and I, I give this analogy uh, to people, uh, particularly to our, our, right, our white brothers and sisters. Um, it's like racism for me, it's like, um, uh, when you see us, uh, people have smoke detectors in their house, right? And smoke detectors detect things that are visible that you can see, right? And with there's a fire, it doesn't detect the fire, it detects the smoke because you see the smoke. And it's supposed to give you an alarm before you, the fire gets to you. So racism is, is, is not like that. Racism is like some of you, I don't know, raise your hand if you got carbon monoxide detectors in your house. Right, and, and carbon monoxide detectors um, are there to alert you to when there's too much carbon monoxide in your home. Um, the difference is carbon monoxide is invisible and you can't smell it, but it still does the same thing that fire will do and smoke will do to you, which is kill you. And I say racism is like carbon monoxide. It is the silent killer of us all, whether you're black, white, brown, yellow, purple, it doesn't matter what your race is, racism affects all of us. Now it affects some of us to a, 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 a much larger extent. And what happens in my opinion in my 20 something years of doing this work, I've, you know, Big Brothers Big Sisters, we serve 95% uh, or more kids who live below the poverty line. We serve 80% or more kids who are black and brown, right? And so we are seeing a confluence of issues and challenges with our kids and the families in which they reside. And especially during the pandemic, we, I'm sure all of you have had your own personal challenges. But when I, if I could sit and tell you some of the stories that I've heard from our staff in terms of what our kids have had to experience, even one of our kids, uh, in, in Camden, New Jersey, who lost their mom, their grandmother, their aunt, and their uncle all in the course of six months, right? So imagine that, but then imagine kids who've had to deal with that same challenge, not during the pandemic, but their entire life, right? We have kids who, had, who were born into a pandemic and who will die in a pandemic. And that pandemic is racism. And, and the effects of that on the spirit, on the mental state and on the emotional and the physical state is, 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 is like, I can't even put it in words, right? And, and, and Dr. Tony, you, 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 you made a statement about anger and you may not like what I'm gonna say, but I, I, I tell people all the time, like I, I'm, I'm like the incredible Hulk, I stay angry. 
I just control it so I don't turn into the, the green thing, right? But I stay angry, right? And, I, and, and, and I, I stay angry because I see what happens to children. And then I see how we blame children for what they are acting out on because society has thrown them away. And so, you know, that my anger for me helps me to continue to have the passion to do what I do, right? To tell the truth, to make sure, I know I got 30 seconds, thank you Garfield, to tell the truth and to speak power, uh, and speak truth to power. And so um, poverty, incarceration and trauma has an amazing effect on mental health. And really quick Garfield, um, I was uh, a personal story, I was, I was being, um, when I first took this job, they want to take out an insurance policy because as a CEO, you know, an organization or a corporation wants to make sure if something happens to you, there's a value that they want to be compensated for if I were to die, right? And so they sent a, a white nurse, a white male nurse out to do my vitals and all of that stuff before they could put a $2 million insurance policy on me, right? And so when he came and I, and I came down the steps and he looked at me and he came to my house, he said, you look like you're in great shape. But I guarantee you when I take your vitals, there was gonna be, and he didn't mean anything by it, but he said, I think, uh, I guarantee you we're gonna find something wrong. And I said, okay, fine. So we did everything and everything checked out really well. Uh, great shape, everything. And I asked him, I said, why did you think that I was gonna have something wrong? He said, well, normally when I do this with black people, there's always some kind of symptom that pops up, right? And he asked me a very, I think very, a deliberate question. He said, Marcus, why do you think that is? And I said, well, I'm no doctor. I said, but what I would say to you is, let me ask you a question. And, and, I, and I pose this question to all of you. How many times in a month, in a 30-day month, do you think of yourself as Black? Or do you think of yourself as white? And I did this in audiences of over 100 people. And every time I've done it, the white people would say, zero. They never think of themselves as a not white person, person, not one day in a month. Every time I've done it with black and brown people, they've said every day, all day. So imagine the stress of knowing how you show up in this mm. country and what that does to your mental, your emotional, and your physical health. I know I'm out of time, Garfield, so I'm going to turn it back over to you. Okay. I won't send this message in. Okay. All right. Forever. All right. <laughs> Good. Okay. All right. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, thank you so very much. Uh, we have a question now for Dr. Uh, Lorena. And uh, her question will be, uh, and this is, uh, this is a very good question uh, on the spiritual side. As Black people face onslaught of grief, stress, and isolation triggered by the devastating pandemic, how can churches play a critical role in addressing the mental health of their members and the greater community? I know that's a whole lot of question for five that's minutes. That's a whole lot of question, but yeah. let, me, let me attempt, but let me just say something um, uh, to, 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 to answer real quick, something that Marcus said. Again, oh, that was not mentioned. It was, Rick, one of the things is unconscious bias. Okay, so in other words, these people, again, folks have these biases, and we do too, that we don't even acknowledge. And again, when you look at what happens with kids, um, I thought of quickly, a friend of mine had a poem one time that said, I killed a child today, not in the usual way, not with a gun or a knife, but I ignored his life. So we can't afford to ignore these kids today, no matter, again, where they sit or where they stand. And when it comes again to this unconscious bias and microaggressions where people will say things, and I know Dr. Tony probably gets it, Marcus gets it, and I do too. It's like, oh, you speak well. Well, what did you expect? Okay. So again, people say things that, you know, that they, they think they're giving you a compliment and you know better. It, it's like, and so we are not the, we're not the exception, you know, the rule, there are many people of color that are great orators and speakers. So I just wanted to throw that in first. Okay. Yeah, so now yeah. I'll go to my no, question. No, no, no. I'm going to give Dr. Tony a chance Thank you, to, Dr. Tony. To, to, uh, to respond. I was, yes. Yes. I was advised that I did not give you the opportunity. You so See, Dr. Dr. Tony, Tony time's yours. You. Okay. Time's yours. 
<laughs> Thank you. I, I want to speak to the trauma part because um, trauma I have seen be minimized, especially in the Black community, because it's almost normalized in an unhealthy way. Right? This is just how it is. Yeah. This is just how it is. And, and so trauma is stored in our bodies. It's stored in our bodies. It's not just in our thoughts, it's in our bodies. And so if we're walking around feeling unsafe, it makes sense why our culture and our community, if that feels safe to us, we would want to do whatever is necessary to stay connected within there and not do whatever feels counterintuitive to it or, or is a threat to making it seem like we're outside of our culture. And so for me, that experience was, I didn't fit, I didn't fit in either way, black or white. I didn't have the safety of that. So I was forced to figure it out in a different way, but the trauma is still stored in all of our bodies. And if we don't address it, Marcus, like you were saying, it shows up in our medical health. Yeah. It shows up in our yeah. physical health. It, I, I mean, I've, I, I've seen it way too much to say that it's not possible. I literally, I see it all every day. I see it all the time, even within myself. I've seen it even within myself. I mean, you could feel, you could feel it in my neck. I could feel it in my neck. I got TMJ as a result. Yeah. And I had to work through that. Or I could just like, oh no, no, no. I, I, I got to work hard because I got to prove myself. I got to work. This is just yeah. what it is to be a, a minority in this world. This is just yeah. what it is. But no, trauma needs to be addressed. I agree. I agree. And it's okay if you've experienced it because unfortunately, most of us have. And so that goes back to, it's okay to not be okay. And we can all be able to have a conversation and talk more about that. You are not alone in that experience, even though your experience is your own. So I want to be mindful of time, but that's what I've been. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Dr. you, Dr. Tony. Tony. And, I, and, and I didn't mean to, to skip you on, on that question. Uh, but now, Dr. Lorena, I'm, I'm going to repeat the question. Okay. Uh, as black people face an onslaught of grief, stress, and isolation, triggered by a devastating pandemic, how can churches play a crucial role in addressing the mental health of their members and the greater community? Okay, uh, just the first, uh, first thing I wanna say is we have to acknowledge that it exists, okay? Many yeah. times folks will act like it does not happen. So I think again, it's the same for mental health in the church. And, and again, I'm gonna give you a stat According to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, 264 million people struggle with depression and 40 million struggle with anxiety. And it is no different in the church. Acknowledging <laughs> that, 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 again, there are different um, pressures on the outside world that cause us to have trauma. But, but the thing I want to say, the first thing, I call them the four R's when I'm looking at a church that is mental health equipped church and what they need. The first thing is they have to be able to recognize when an individual is struggling with a mental health care problem. And, and, and so that, so don't ignore it. And, and many pastors don't feel they're equipped. I know I don't feel equipped to handle that. And guess what? And I'm going to say this, it takes more than prayer people. You can pray about it, but unless you do something about it, it won't change. So again, we're starting to give many of our churches resources that they can refer their members to. But I think you have to acknowledge that first off, recognize that, that an individual is struggling with a mental health problem, that there is a situation, there is such something wrong. And it's more than just when they say, well, I'm having a financial issue. I mean, it could be abuse issue. Oh, and again, in the back of all of that, is mental. And, and again, there's nothing new. In the Bible, we have people that struggled with mental health. Look at David. I mean, I mean yeah. like, oh, well, we want, well, I, I don't have to go into that. David had issues. Yeah. Okay. Moses had issues. Yeah, issues. Yeah. Okay. So we all have issues. But the first thing is to recognize when an individual is struggling with the mental health care issue. Second, that we have to be able to make, I'm going to say this, and that Dr. Tony, that's why I'm glad you're here a professional referral, okay? Yeah. And connect the individual to a mental health provider, someone that you trust, someone you know. I mean, family of counsel of churches, there are many that are out there, but you need, and I've been to a therapist. I said, someone said, read, I said, let me tell you something. There was a time in my life when I wasn't okay. And guess what? It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. So again, so a professional referral, connect them to that. And then 
Third, they are trained to relate. So again, we go from recognize it to referral to relate to individuals with mental health problems and or their families. And now here's the key part, in a compassionate and grace-filled way, no judgment, no judgment. So when, you know, so again, someone again, that's objective and is able to look at the situation outside of what you in fact are going through. And my final one is, so again, we go from recognize to referral to relate. The final one is restorative. There are programs, restorative programs that can meet the special needs and problems of individuals and families struggling with mental health. So, so I think it's key again, that you have to acknowledge that there in fact, is a problem and, and, and that I, you heard me say it, it's okay to pray, but you have to pray with action is what I call it, PIA, all right? So you put an action plan in place. And, and again, th does this simply mean we have to accept mental health in the church? Uh, well, we do, I, I think we do. You, do you have people in the church? All right, you've got people sitting next to people. And I often find you can share so much. Um, Dr. Tony mentioned shame. Oh my goodness, I can't tell anybody. Oh, yes, you can. Yes, you can. And the church has to be compassionate and loving and embracing. And how do I help you? How do I get you to where you need, on the way to wellness, okay? You heard me say the four R's of a mental health equipped church. So you gotta be equipped, okay? Just like the Lord equips us, like Dr. Tony is equipped to do what she does, all right? I'm equipped to do, I can give you some spiritual things that you can do, but at some point, the spiritual ends and the practical begins. Mm -hmm. so, so again, I think it indeed is a combination of the two. So finding how we put those together. Okay, does that help? No, that's, that's, that's great, that's great. So those are my four R's, okay? okay. Good. I'm going to uh, uh, come to you now, Dr. Tony, uh, to see what uh, uh, your uh, opinion is uh, for, to the same question. Uh, would you like, me, like for me to repeat it? No, no that's okay. You got it? Okay. Dr. All right. Tony's got this one. Mm -hmm. Let's go with it. I appreciate the power of your message that you just shared. It's the emotion, like I started out saying earlier, spiritual and mental health meet through our emotions. Yes. Mm -hmm. They meet our emotions. The way in which we connect with our God, higher power, whatever you believe in, is emotional. Exactly. So we're defying or denying our emotions, suppressing or repressing them. We are going to hit a wall. We're going to hit a wall. And it's, it's, you can't move past it until we can process the emotions. Anger being one of them, but all of the emotions. And when you can feel the emotions more, even the challenging ones, you feel the good ones more too. Joy grows if you learn how to process the trauma and the pain and the shame. And is it uncomfortable? Heck yes. Is it painful even? Yes. But that's what it means to be strong. Being the strong one isn't about denying your emotions. Being the strong one is about feeling them and knowing that you deserve to get that support. So I did put a couple of resources in there, therapy resources in there. I do have a book coming out next week, which is, it's the reset to help with resetting for folks that feel stuck. And so there are resources out there. And I think we need to bridge the spiritual mental health together more and more like we are today so that the resources that exist can also be more known because it doesn't matter if a resource is there if you don't know about it, right? So we wanna be able to increase visibility around that as well. That's good, great. Right. Marcus? The Tony talks some more. Um, yeah, <laughs> matter of fact, Dr. Tony, I, I may want to follow up with you because I, I have a question that may be different in this in terms of why is it that a lot of, when you trying to find black therapists for the mental health piece, they don't accept insurance, right? And so you got to pay all out of pocket and that's a big challenge for our families. And so I'd love to figure out if you could even put a resource in the chat that has you know, black therapists that accept insurance. Um, I, I thought everything that was said was pretty awesome. You know, one of the things uh, 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 Lorena, Dr. Lorena said was um, when we talk about the church, well, my pastor, uh, 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 Pastor Waller at Eden Baptist Church all, talks about in one of his sermons about like 85% or more pastors deal with anxiety. Yep. Um, the, 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 the turnover rate of pastors is higher than it's ever been before. Um, we have less church participation by a lot of young people 
in the church today. And so I, I think anxiety is and, 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 and trauma is affecting the church as well, not just the people who attend, but oh, yeah. the people uh, who, you know, the, the people who are, 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 are pastoring to um, the congregation. And so um, I, I, I see less of a delineation between an and embarrassment, at least at the church level, in terms of the churches I go to, in terms of understanding that people are dealing with anxiety, understanding that people are dealing with mental health and providing resources for those people. So I'm, I'm happy to see that. And then just lastly, personally, you know, I never thought I was a person who dealt with anxiety. I, I went on a, a bike ride recently. I, I rode my bike in, to raise awareness for kids from San Francisco to Atlantic City and, and, and rode my bike like 4,000 miles to just really do something for big brothers and big sisters and understand um, what I could do in terms of raising awareness of what the trauma that kids are facing during the pandemic. And my third day on the ride, and we were going into Nevada and these amazing canyons and we're seeing all this beautiful stuff. And this amazing calmness came over me, right? I'm on the bike for six to eight hours a day. And I recognized at that point that I had been dealing with anxiety in my regular life because I never, I never, I didn't feel that peace that I felt while I was out exactly. in the, in the, on the countryside riding this bike. Exactly. And it really made me go inward. And, and, and I'll just leave you with something that I've done since then that has helped me deal with anxiety. For those of you who are dealing with anxiety and other challenges, um, I read this book called uh, The Miracle Morning. And in the book, Hal Elrod talks about this savers um, uh, practice, uh, talking about doing the, putting the practice in, putting the work in. And so for a hundred and, and I look at my journal here, 182 days straight, I've been practicing savers. It's silence, affirmation, visualization, exercise, reading and scribing. Every morning I, I, I pray and then I meditate for 10 minutes. Every morning I have written down in my, my journal affirmations that I say to myself, Marcus, you are an amazing CEO. Marcus, you are the best father that you can be. And then I have a, a vision board that I look at and these are three pictures of things that I want to accomplish in life. Exercise every morning. All of you exercise every morning. Uh, read at least 10 pages of a book. And then the last one, just as important, journal, like scribing, mm -hmm. like talking about what you did the day before, what you want to accomplish today, and five things you're grateful for, right? Absolutely. So Garfield, that's my piece. I know my 30 seconds. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you so very much. Listen, uh, thank you all for your comments on that last question there. Uh, we do want to get to the questions in, in the chat, but we have, we're, we're going to spend about five minutes on this one question collectively. All right, so, you know, so the, the, the question and the very last question that we want, that we have for you as the committee today is, what gives you hope about the future of black health and wellness? Tony, Dr. Tony, you're up first. The 2016 election, I picked my six-year-old daughter up. She got in the car, she says, mom, is Trump gonna kill all the black people? Oh, she was six. <clears throat> so in the moment, even talking about it, right? Like I automatically, the emotion. My heart sank. There was not a bubble in the world I could keep my daughter in to keep her safe. So what I realized in that moment, that was my last burnout year. That was the last bout of my burnout. Second time was in burnout. I said, I want to be the mom that helps her feel safe and supported in this world that is not always safe and supported. I don't want to react with bitterness or anger. I don't want to react because I don't want her to feel that. I don't want her to see the world that way. I want her to be able to keep herself safe and feel safe and feel love. Mm -hmm. So fast forward. So that was, there was a lot that went in that. And what that required was that I need to unplug from social media and all the shoulds I was beating myself against the head with about what I should and shouldn't be and how I should, I had to unplug from that. And I turned inward. And I reconnected in a different way with myself and my faith and prioritized self-care because self-care is not a luxury. It is a requirement of quality living and quality relationships. And so fast forward to now, we're looking for our forever house. We move out of our first house and looking for our forever house. And we're having conversations about diversity or lack thereof in some of the places that we're looking for the kind of 
house that we're looking for. And I talk to her and I say, you know, in some of these places, it's not going to be very diverse if we get the house we want in this place. And she says, mom, it's never going to change if we don't change it. That's what gives me hope is Thank that you. when we take care of ourselves and we demonstrate that for our children, then yeah. they can also be the change and they can believe in themselves. Okay, Dr. Lorena. Okay, uh, and Dr. Tony, you stole, I, I'm checking off the things that I wrote down, okay? But thank you so much. But uh, as, I, as, I, as we look at why we're here today and we look at the fact that we're celebrating black history, um, we're celebrating who we are, um, we're celebrating where we've come from. And, and what gave, gives me hope is I, when I look back at all those who have gone before me and I love, I got a quick poem that it came to my mind as I was sitting here and it was one by Alice Walker and it was called Women. And, and she said, and it means and men too, but it says they were women then, my mama's generation, husky of voice and sad of step, battered down doors, armed starched white shirts, walked through landmines, booby traps, even when they didn't know a page of it themselves. They were women then. So we are a resourceful people. And I believe what, what, that when it, when it gets tough, we, we step to the plate. And I've seen those of us step to the plate and we've been resilient. We've, we've been what? Not afraid. I look at all that happened during the George Floyd incident. I mean, folks step forward. And, and so I am hopeful. And what I'm real hopeful about is that the generation behind me is not afraid to step up and, and have a voice. So again, I hear their voices. And I think we, as the, what well, I'll, I'll say myself, as a senior person, that I've got to support them. So I am hopeful about not just today, but, but tomorrow for our people based on all that I see our young people do. We, you look at the Amanda Gorman, you know, you got to see it. When, when she stood there and did that poem, I was like, wow, you go. And that's what, and, and Amanda is just one of them, but there's so many that need the opportunity to do that. So again, I am hopeful because I see this generation stepping up and doing great things. How's that? All right, yeah. Marcus. Mark. Yeah, so uh, I, I am very hopeful. I, 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 yeah. I consider myself a relentless optimist. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, one of the things someone asked me uh, a, a while ago, maybe a year or so ago, and they said, uh, you know, they were saying, Marcus, this is so like, and I was doing a lot of uh, a social media, like live uh, posting when the pandemic was really mm -hmm. um, first hitting and we were having all the right, uh, the, the, the protests and, and, and even yeah. some looting and all that stuff. And I was out in the streets capturing it. And it, but most of it, I was sitting at home at my computer. Someone said, Marcus, oh man, we feel so bad for you out here. And I said, listen, no. I ain't no dogs biting me. I ain't nobody spraying me with water holes. No. We ain't being lynched. I said, this is a whole different type of protest and fight yes. that we have before us. Yes. And we don't have to put as much on the line as people before us had to put on the line. I agree. That's one. Two, young people. Like, all right, and I can give you every stat in terms of how young people are suffering and all the things that, and, and, and their families and the communities that we have. But when I look at it, I'm just like, these kids are learning some resilience that we've exactly. never seen before. They are being exactly. raised in a pandemic that is unfortunately have given them tough lessons and challenges. Yes. But we all know that you are only as strong as the challenges you face, right? Yes. And so, and then thirdly, um, this is the best time to be a black man, black woman in, in, in the there history you know. of this country, right? For moment. the first time, like we could go out in public and talk to a large crowd of folks and tell them, hey, this is some messed up stuff we're going through. Let me tell you like how, like for, for the first time, black folks can tell people how they feel yep. about being black and not just be talking to black folks and the white allies that they feel safe around. Exactly. Right? And so mm -hmm. I, I think there's so much to be yeah, thankful and grateful for. And there's so much work that still has to be done. I agree. And, and so and, and, and as, as, as a leader of, of, of an organization that works with kids, I have balance between being angry when I see things, continue to see things that aren't moving as fast as I want them to move, but also being jubilant and being excited yes. and expectant 
about what I know we can accomplish in our communities and in this country. And so uh, Garfield, thank you for that question. And thank you for asking a question that ends on more of a positive note, because I do feel yeah. very positive. It just depends on when you catch me. <laughs> At least you're not angry, OK? <laughs> yeah, OK, no. thank you. Thank you. Uh, we do have some questions in, in the chat that we would, uh, I'm just going to uh, read them out. And uh, we'll, start, uh, we'll start from uh, you, Dr. Arena, to Marcus and to Tony. Yeah. And then back to the other way uh, for the questions, okay. but we 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 we'd like to get a response from from all three to the to to uh, to the question. Okay. Uh, what are the suggestions for white passing professionals that want to connect? No, I'm sorry. No. Uh, oh, want to connect with the BIPOC clients to mental health services? Is that is that your business, Dr. Tony? Can you repeat that question? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to say. What was that question again? Uh, what are the suggestions for white or white passing professionals that want to connect BIPOC clients to mental health services? Hmm. I don't know whose question that oh, is. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think I hear it. it. It's like, how do they refer people of color if they are a white professional uh -huh. to a African American professional? I, if, if I if I'm read if I'm hearing that right. Okay. Am I right? Okay. So again, how do they get to a Dr. Tony? Okay. How do they get to, uh, there's a group, the Lapido group, which is an African-American um, uh, therapist. So, so again, there are resources that are out there. So we can probably get a listing. I think that's what they're asking, Dr. Tony. Help me with that. But there's a listing of, 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 of African-American therapists. But again, it's not a big list. No. All right. And that, that's one of the reasons that we're working with the Black Brain Campaign to get more therapists that are out there. But Dr. Tony, I pass to you. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I, I will create a list and I will send that yeah. either to Garfield or Howard oh, that, so that they can provide great. that. That'd be great. Um, I will say that, yes, there are Black therapists, um, but the, the challenges there that I see are then Black therapists feel obligated and they burn themselves out because of those poor boundaries. Yeah. And so that in part answers some of your question, Marcus, around insurance, because if you're burning yourself out and you can barely make ends meet because you have to pay back all the schooling that you had, plus you feel like you have to try to resolve everything for the black culture by taking in as many people as you can, right. and you're not getting paid well by the insurance, you have to make some kind of decision or you burn out. And I've seen that happen many a times as well, but I will create a list because there are black therapists they do want to support. And if you are um, a a white or white passing individual that wants to make that connection, I say, let them take the lead. Don't assume that they want to work with a black therapist. Exactly. Let them ask. Right. Yeah. Let them ask. Yeah. 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 And I think the other part, um, when you talk about therapists, especially therapists of color, we have to work closer with them. And that's one of the things that I'm doing with Black Brain and also some of the other groups with credentialing. That you, I see you making faces at me, Dr. Tony, because again, that's always a challenge and an issue. And, and often it seems once we learn it, of what, once we understand it, it changes and it's ever evolving. So it, it's making sure Lorena who's on the inside can then help with folks who are on the outside in service with regard to credentialing and what can we do to do that? So that's a big challenge. When Marcus, when you mentioned that, that, that credentialing is, is major. So we have to make sure that the, the supports are in place to get them through the system and get them credentialed. Mm -mm. Yeah, and I think to me, when I ask the question, I, I think that's great because, uh, and great for that perspective, Dr. Tony, um, and, I, and I'm a solution-oriented person. Mm -hmm. And so when I hear that, it makes me think, uh, Dr. Lorena, that, um, you know, there needs to, we need to figure out how do we get more not only get more black therapists credentialed, but also how do we get supplemental revenue for them to serve their community, right? Because they shouldn't have to live in poverty to I serve agree. poor people, right? And so it sounds like a, a bigger challenge that needs well, to be addressed. We, and it's not just, and dollars are important. As a matter of fact, it makes me think of a, um, a project we're doing with the Temple Health System where we are funding, in other words, getting more nurses on the front line that look like us. So what we've done, again, the foundation 
is that we are giving a full ride to students that are getting that are going into nursing. And when I say full ride, counseling, boot camp, uh, scholarships, uh, uh, the promise of a job when they come out. And that's what I mean about putting those supports. But I think also realizing when they come in and they've come in from not having opportunities that they don't come in like everybody else. There are extra supports that we have to get in place. So that's one of the things that the foundation is doing right now. And then yesterday, I think I saw where Penn is doing for mm -hmm. nurse practitioners. They just got a $125 million um, gift from SD Lauder for so again, but we got to make sure that we're a part of that. See, that's, yeah. that's the key. Okay. All right. Okay. We have oh, a, I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry. okay. We're going to go to the next question here from the chat. Uh, how do you disseminate the school to prison pipeline and help children heal as a community? What can we do? And Marcus, I'm going to put you on the spot to answer that question first. You know, you know I'm glad you did because <laughs> one of the things that, uh, it, it, Continue, made me even angrier is when I, I when I was living in Fairmount, I was walking from our office, Garfield, to my house. And I looked across the street for whatever reason. And for the first time, I, ne I didn't even think about it until I saw it. And I was like, oh, and this was like a year ago, uh, but two years ago when the pandemic first started. And I was like, oh my God, they're building yeah. the, the police Prison. district and it's connected to the school district building. If that is a prison to pipe, you know, school to uh, prison pipeline. Wow. I don't know what is like how, like how do our yeah. leaders not just say like, we should not be building a prison that's connected to the school district building. Like, so that, that so, but to answer your question, um, you know, I sit on the United States Civil Rights Commission. We just did a, uh, a we worked on this uh, report for three years that we are submitting to Congress um, around Pennsylvania and it's, um, uh, this, uh, disproportional uh, 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 attitude towards particularly black girls and also black boys where we have, we disproportionately suspend black girls ages five to eight more than any state in the country. That's ridiculous. Right? So that when we, we, it's not a consequence, it's a punishment. When we punish kids and, and suspend and expel them from school, what that does is that increases their their chances of going to prison a hundredfold. We also know that 99% of, of people, at least uh, this is stale stats, this is probably from five years ago, uh, who are in prison didn't have a high school diploma. So we know um, from empirical data that education is a, is, a, is a great deterrent to people being incarcerated, right? We also know that the second piece of that though, because it can't, uh, be alone, like that's not going to solve it in and of itself. There has to be skills that allow and access to jobs, right? And so there has to be, we know that our schools for the most part do not teach our young people or adults how to maintain themselves after that, that schooling is over. And so exactly. we need to really revamp our education system. Like we have the same education system we had in 1910, exactly. right? The thing about that, we're 110 years from uh, 112 years, and we really haven't made a lot of progress in how we educate folks and understanding that different kids need to be educated differently, right? Uh, boys need to be educated differently than girls in some instances. And yeah. so we have not made those, uh, th those necessary changes in schools, Garfield, and we continue to look at Black boys, particularly Black boys, but Black boys and girls, as if they're guilty no matter if they're around something, they're associated with it, then we are punishing them for something that really should, uh, there should be a different consequence. There should be a different approach to how we work with kids who are having challenges in our schools and in the streets. In 2017, 2018, there was 15,000 arrests of young people in Philadelphia, 15,000, right? So how many prison beds is that, right? Because you know, <laughs> As soon as you have contact with the prison system, there's something called the pull of gravity. Like as soon as they do not let you go, once you're in the system, it is hard to get out of that system. And so um, I can't answer all of that question. Uh, no, no, thank you. Share that I appreciate it. Well. Okay, all right. I have a question here for Dr. Tony. Uh, what challenges do black therapists and psychologists come across when trying to gain access to funding streams and programs that allow them to work 
<clears throat> with and treat individuals from within the black and minority uh, communities? I think that's a great question. Um, I have worked in a community mental health. I've worked in school-based systems. I worked in residential systems um, for, for teens that are receiving treatment. And so I've worked in a variety of different settings and money is always yeah. a thing. Let's just put it that way. Like that's always a thing. Um, but when I decided to go out on my own um, and create my private practice and then create my, my coaching business, I run those too. Um, Part of that was it, when you're in the system and you see the flaws and you yourself are burnt out, yeah. it feels like you're banging your head against the wall. I, I mean, it's just the, the suicide rate among healthcare professionals oh, yeah. is no joke, right? And so I, ha I, I had to take care of, I learned I had to take care of myself. In fact, um, to that end, I had an existential crisis. It was pouring outside. I was in my car and I realized the moment I realized, Marcus, it's imprinted in my head that I couldn't accept insurance in my private practice. I could do sliding scale and I could, you know, I could do, but I couldn't accept insurance because I have three young children. I have $150,000 in student loans to pay back. I have a mortgage to pay. I, I couldn't take care of myself and be the best mom, wife, homeowner, mother, like I couldn't do all of it. And I had to be okay with that. But I felt guilty as all get out when I made that, like it was one of the hardest professional decisions I've ever made. And so it's so multifaceted. We need to learn that it's okay to take care of ourselves. And that's not selfish. It allows us to take better care of others. And when we do that, we can lean into our gifts more and we can do more. I have more time now to do something like this, volunteer my time. I would have never been able to do that if I hadn't made that decision. I wouldn't have this time to volunteer with you all today, right? So it is hard. I mean, there are hard decisions. There's multifaceted um, systemic challenges that create those barriers, but ultimately we need to be okay with taking care of ourselves. And sometimes that is a challenge with, with black therapists, especially, especially if you're a mom and you have student loans to pay back, which, okay. which is common which is common no. and you know you're also you're not you can't be all things to all people all at the same time that was when people say oh Lorena you multitask I, yeah right but you still can only do one, one thing, thing at a time, time. <laughs> so we have to again you have to pick your lane and I, I mean we we would love to save the world god knows i would but i can't so you have to do as much as you can for as many as you can while you can Okay, um, and so, especially, I'm sorry, go ahead. Garth. No, 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 go ahead, I'm sorry. No, 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 I, and then I was just gonna say, um, you know me and saying, I'm thinking of Michelle Obama right now, and Michelle had a, has a quote that I love where she says, you should have three good friends, one you aspire to be like, one who can get in your world and, or say, baby girl, sister, girlfriend, or, or guy, this is what you need to do. But the most important thing is we need to be pulling someone up behind us. So we need to be really be pulling people behind us as we go forward, because we won't always be here. We won't always be here. So uh, again, that's okay. I I'll stop Garfield. Mm -mm. <laughs> I'm, I'm wound up now. Okay. You, you know, I don't believe that. <laughs> Listen, I, I, I just want to, you know, there's that there's still a, a, a few questions in the in the chat. We we have a 130 hard stop. And okay. you know, we could go on talking about this forever. There's not enough time to really, you know, accomplish what we even the few questions that we put on the agenda because they expand into different areas. But I want to there, there's so many positive uh, uh, remarks in the chat about the, the panel today. The topics, uh, your 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 comments. Uh, so we really uh, appreciate, uh, uh, and I'm speaking on behalf of the entire committee. We really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules, yeah. and, and 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 shedding such light on these two topics of uh, a mental and and spiritual health. We knew that when we picked this topic, that uh, it, it was going to be you know just like this just like this and and we really uh, want to thank you for being here today and 
and, and taking your time. Uh, we want to thank all of our program uh, uh, participants uh, who have uh, participated in the program uh, today. Uh, thank you. I, I know that we, we kind of got with a little rocky start with a name, but you know, we, we, I, I think we, as they tell you in the airplane, we made up for it in the air. So we, we so, so, so we were kind of speeding a little bit. Uh, we want to thank all our Montgomery County uh, uh, officials who uh, are here today. I, I see some other people uh, on the on the call. Uh, our guests who have tuned into our program today. Uh, once again, the entire Black History Committee. And these are the people that we, we always forget. It's the people that make this happen. Our IT people, the people who set this thing up, the people that make, you know, your faces appear here and my face appear there. Uh, so we really want to, we really want to thank them. And I just wanted to give you a, a short preview of what's going to happen next week, which will be our final week in our Black History program. But we continue Black History every day, every day, because we are, we are history makers. So we want, and we want our children to know the same, the, the same thing and to feel the same way. So the next week's topic is going to be COVID-19 in the Black community hmm. on Wednesday, February 23rd at 12 o'clock. Okay. You won't want to miss uh, this program. And certainly you can go on that same website and, and to uh, register for that. And I just want to give you a, run, a rundown of who's going to be here. Uh, our Negro National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing, will be sung by the Pine Forge Academy Choir. Wonderful. Our welcome will be done by Donna Richmond, who is the chief of DEI for Montgomery County. Great. Opening remarks will be by State Senator Art Hayward. Wonderful. And our speaker of the day will be Dr. Ayla Stanford. Wonderful. Founder of Black Doctors Consortium. Okay. And on the panel also will be a Dr. Octavia Pickett Blakely, Associate Professor at Penn medicine so we we you know we're we're finishing on a very high note yeah. you know, all of our panelists from from the beginning from our first week to to including today you have been wonderful i i there was some concern about uh uh not being able to utilize the, all of the time correctly but uh, mm -hmm. I, I i had to do what i had to do uh, uh to some of you with the chats and everything but i think it worked out I want to also thank my, uh, our timekeeper, uh, who uh, she really uh, she really kept in touch with me. I, I didn't I didn't have to use it a, a whole lot, but 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 once again we, we had to keep it moving. But uh, once again, uh, the information that you put into the uh, the chats uh, as far as references and those things, and we're and and you're looking we're looking from something from you, Doctor Tony. Is that correct? A list of okay, fine. All right, so you can you can send that to Hakeem or or to me or Laura or whoever, and we will make sure that it gets out. Great. And Garfield, well, are there any questions that still need to be answered, and they you can send them to us, and we can still answer them if if okay. that's the desire. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor Blake. I I really appreciate you doing that, and I'm quite sure you would you would feel the same way, right, Marcus? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, as a matter of fact, I, I, I look forward to that. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Okay. And Dr. Tony, same, same thing. Absolutely. Okay. Just put my email in the chat. All right. Well, thank you all. And uh, that concludes our program and we'll give you a, uh, uh, no, you know what we're not going to do. Give us something positive to leave on each, each of you. We have seven minutes. We have seven minutes. So, I have this card that I put at my desk that is a reminder. Promise yourself to be so strong that nothing can disturb your peace of mind. Look at the sunny side of everything and make your optimism come true. Think only of the best, work only for the best and expect only the best. Forget the mistakes of the past and press on to the greater achievements of the future. Give so much time to the improvement of yourself that you have no time to criticize others. Live in faith that the whole world is on your side so long as you are true to the best that is in you. And we all have that best within us. We, we don't want to forget about that. Thank you, Dr. Tony. Marcus? 
All right, so I have, I'm also going to read something that I, I love. This is it's by uh, someone who's also spiritual, Dr. Uh, Lorraine Marshall Blake, uh, John C. Maxwell, in his book, Developing the Leader Within You 2.0. Yeah. yeah. And it's called The Mirror and Me. And I think, you know, regardless of our race, we all have a, 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 a role to play. And we all have to take accountability for those things that we can control and those things we can't. And so in this, he says, when I look in the mirror, what do I see? Reflections of a double-sided me. One side is everything I ever hoped to be, yet my greatest problem is staring back at me. There are times when I rush out to get ahead and I find myself leading when I need to be led. Courage is needed. How can I overcome me? How can I lead others with authenticity? I will remember the best and worst in me. Doing this will keep me growing humbly. I will seek others out more faithful than me and ask for help with my vulnerabilities. To lead and do right, that is my possibility. To do this, I will visit my mirror regularly. So I, I leave you with that as we think about how can we serve our community, how can we serve our kids, and the quote that I said by Martin Luther King, that we all can serve. And so that's what I would leave you with, you and your audience with, Garfield. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you very much. Dr. Marshall Blake, you're on mute. I'm going to take one of my favorite scriptures, um, and it's from Psalm 37, 4, um, where it says, take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. <laughs> mm. Amen? That's a, that, Amen? That's a good one. That's Amen. a good one. That, like they say in Baptist church, that's a good one. Amen. <laughs> That'll well, preach. Well, well listen, <laughs> thank you all. And, you know, and it was nice seeing you. And keep Black History alive. It's every day. <laughs> thank in you. In every way. All right. We'll there also be day. having closing remarks by our COO, Lee Sotisiak, on next week. He will be closing oh. out our program. Thank okay. You. Thank you so much, Laura. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Have a great day, everybody. Bye bye. bye, -bye.